Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our discussion today on Is Technology Truly a Solution? My name is Amy Kupal. I am the CEO of the Ontario Caregiver Organization, and I am really delighted to be here today with an amazing group of experts who have not only professional but personal experience where they've had the opportunity to explore this question. And so we'll have an opportunity to hear from each of them and also have some discussion about all of the nuances associated with this question because it, it really isn't a yes no kind of answer. There are so many facets to this and I'm looking forward to exploring all of them. Before we kick this off, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that this session is uh, being held on the, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna start that again. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. And while we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. And we do this to affirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation people that call this nation home. So we're really delighted to be here and to have this conversation, and I'm really looking forward to exploring these themes with you. For me, this is both a professional passion and a personal interest. So as a caregiver myself, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had the opportunity to use technology in a variety of ways both in terms of engaging with healthcare providers and in healthcare settings, but also as a part of my caregiving role. So I'm currently a caregiver for my dad who's in his 80s and I've also had the opportunity in the past to be a caregiver for my mom through her cancer and palliative care journey and also through my brother's journey uh, with cerebral palsy throughout his lifetime. So this means a lot to me, and I think we've also had the opportunity to explore at OCO the many impacts that technology has had on people through the pandemic and it would be impossible to have a discussion like this without recognizing so many of the ways that things have evolved in such a short period of time during the pandemic and so we'll hear from the perspectives of the panelists on that and we've also had the opportunity to hear from many of you already related to your questions and related to the ways that technology is working and not working for you. So we're going to kick off our discussion by hearing from a caregiver who's been very, very active in so many ways, supporting other caregivers, being a part of many change processes, and who can also speak to her own lived experience around technology. So I'm going to turn it over first to Carol Ann Alloway and uh, get her perspective as the co-founder of Family Caregivers Voice and as a caregiver. Thank you very much, and let me say thank you to being invited um, to sit on this panel of truly remarkable people. As you heard, my name is Caroline Alloway, and I've been a caregiver for my husband, Bill, for the last 11 years. First experience acute and home care through 10 operations in seven years, and most recently in oncology. Is technology truly a solution? I would have to say it depends. There are many factors for deciding whether technology is appropriate and what level of technology, because there are so many opportunities in health and social care to interact with patients, families, as well as consulting with other providers. As a family caregiver who's fairly familiar with technology, I would say it's my preferred method of interaction. Let me give you some examples of our experience with technology. When my husband was referred to a specialist to have an ankle replacement, our family GP sent a fax request to the surgeon. Her office tried for a year to follow up and get an appointment scheduled, but was unsuccessful. So she asked us to follow up. We called and left messages, but never heard back. So I finally went down to the surgeon's office in the hospital to book an appointment in person. Technology should have been able to process the referral with all appropriate documentation, including test results, labs, and notes, while keeping our GP and us in the loop. It should also advise of the first available appointment date that we could agree to or look for a more suitable time. 
Using fax machines is not only unreliable, but is also an outdated method of referral. After each of Bill's operations, he developed infections. I took pictures of Bill's ankle to track progress of the infection and then sent them electronically to the surgeon using a messaging app so he could see the infection progressing and intervene in a timely way. It's a low tech solution, but it worked well. If I didn't do that, I would have had to book an appointment with the surgeon, which you've already heard was quite challenging, maneuver Bill who's on crutches in and out of our car and he's six foot 10 and I'm five foot one. So that's challenging as well as time consuming. And let's talk about trying to find a parking space in downtown Toronto and how much that would cost. So sending pictures was simple, but effective. Recently, Bill was assessed by a gerontologist as requested by our GP. Because of COVID risks, we couldn't see him in person. So the gerontologist called on the phone we assumed he would use this video as it was our first meeting with him. Using the speakerphone feature, I participated on the call. And during the assessment, the doctor asked about Bill's balance and how he was walking and asked for my observations. If we had used video, he could have seen for himself and not relied on my untrained opinion. Of course, some appointments need to be in person. I've heard that patients who have used video conferencing with their doctor are reluctant to show any part of their torso, but are okay with showing the doctor an arm or a leg. So I think patients and doctors need to look at the different options available and use technology appropriately. Of course, there are some populations which either do not have access to technology or are not comfortable using it for a medical appointment? Is there a provincial or federal strategy to ensure technology is available at every corner of Canada? And it's not just patients who need education and training. Some family physicians are still relying on paper. I think COVID has shown us that we can pivot quickly, but our processes haven't caught up yet. For example, the fee-for-service model left doctors in the cold with regard to meeting patients electronically. If I can use an app to order food, pay for it, and see where the delivery person is, the technology is there for improving how we seek and deliver quality health and social care experiences. Of course, we need to address integration and sec security issues. Technology is becoming a necessity in the health and social care arena. The old way of doing things by booking appointments, taking time off work, traveling for an hour to a doctor's office and spending time in the waiting room with sick people to see the doctor for 10 minutes is in many cases unnecessary and an unattractive option. Healthcare professionals, patients, and their families need to sit down together to determine what we need from technology to achieve wellness, to be resilient, and prevent illness. We're in this digital journey together. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much, Carol Ann. You have highlighted so many facets of this question and really kicked us off with an amazing overview of the intricacies that are associated with exploring the use of technology as it pertains to caregivers, to patients, and also healthcare providers. So I really appreciate all of the thoughtfulness that you brought to your introductory comments. And it gives us an opportunity now to explore that further with some of other, other, our other panelists. So we'll go next to Dr. Ewan Affleck. He's the Senior Medical Advisor uh, Health Informatics at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta. And I know he also brings a wealth of knowledge and experience. So we'll turn it over to you, Ewan, please. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate uh, the introduction. And um, just a little bit about myself. I, I, I'm a health informatician and uh, work at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta. I, I also am a clinician and, and have spent uh, I'm on in my scrubs right now, just took off my mask. I just came off the, the, uh, the medicine floor here at the hospital in Yellowknife where I'm working right now. And I've spent 30 years working in Northern Canada uh, as a clinician um, providing care uh, in, in an environment where digital health information technology 
and virtual care really would seem to have a significant value if we were to deploy it meaningfully. So the question is, you know, is technology truly a solution? It's, a, it's an interesting um, uh, question to ask and can we provide compassionate care or can we amplify compassionate care by through the use of technology? You know, and I, I would suggest that we need to look a little bit at history in order to understand our, our, our uh, relationship with technology uh, in healthcare. And I have to say that, um, you know, I've been involved at almost every level uh, as the chief medical information officer in the Northwest Territories deploying solutions uh, across the North uh, and on policy levels as a clinician and as a patient and, and a family member of, of, of people who've been trying to access care. And, and I can say that in the 31 years since the advent of the World Wide Web that I think our industry has not uh, um, done terribly well. I, I think that uh, we have failed in many respects and COVID sort of demonstrated this. We, had about 30 years from the time that digital technology through the use of the World Wide Web really became a reality until COVID uh, in, uh, in, in March. And when COVID happened, it, the, the emperor had no clothes. We were rushing around to try to reinvent ourselves. And the question is, what had we been doing for the prior 30 years? We've seen massive transformations of many, many industries um, communications, banking, travel, so forth and so on, just about everything. And yet our paradigm in healthcare has really, I think, been mired in, in an analog uh, form of behavior. And so we have, we have created disinteroperable uh, technologies, uh, fractured care, fractured information uh, across jurisdictional and, and service boundaries. And, and really created a bit of an environment that at times has, has, has been unsafe. And if you look at the, um, if, you, if you look at, at studies on, on burnout of providers in the last number of years, health information technology is widely recognized as one of the principal drivers of burnout. If you're burning out as a provider, uh, your likelihood of unsafe care increases providing unsafe care increases. And, and in Canada still today, you know, many, many patients, the many beneficiaries of care simply do not have access, let alone control over their information. So how did, how did we get here? Um, so considering the, the notion of compassion, it's, it's hard in an environment that, that is, that is not a, uh, been designed or architected around the value proposition of healthcare, which is to provide compassionate quality care if we're, if we're fracturing the information, which is the raw material that we use to make all our decisions and provide care. Uh, so I come upon this sort of uh, through a lens uh, that suggests that we can do a lot better. I think technology is here to stay. And in fact, I think it can be of significant benefit. But I think that we need to carefully reconsider how we, as an industry, all the different professions, all the administrators, all the patients, all of us in this ecosystem work together uh, around the design of, 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 of information use and then adapt the technology to it because interoperability of our information and our technology will only follow upon human interoperability. And we currently, frankly, lack human interoperability as the precursor or foundational element of a truly compassionate and functional technology system in Canada. Thank you so much, Ewan. And I really appreciate that you've extended this discussion so much with your comments uh, on interoperability, but also around safety and burnout. And I suspect that 
uh, some of those burnout challenges that you've highlighted with healthcare providers uh, would extend to caregivers, uh, where we see, you know, continued high levels of distress amongst caregivers in many, many situations. And so when we face these challenges around not only the human, but also technological and systemic components, then, uh, then we can see that the risk increases for everybody as a part of that process. So appreciate uh, very much your comments on that. Let's hear next from Anna Fote. Anna is the Director of Digital Transformation for Sun Life Financial, and she is also a caregiver. And I'm looking forward to hearing, Anna, what you have to say on this question of, is technology truly a solution? Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And it's been such a great discussion thus far. And I, you know, I really wanted to vote for, yes, it's the huge reason that we're gonna be successful because I'm in fact a technologist. So I'm voting for team tech but I think there's significant challenges in the way that medicine has operated and they're not, they have nothing to do with tech, which is just a tool, right? There's lots of tools and I've spent most of my career in secure collaboration. And so for me coming into this medical world, and I can't quite frankly think of a more collaborative profession than the care of a human across multiple caregivers, practitioners, um, clinicians, but yet everyone operates with looking at their own little hole through the wall, they see a little piece of the puzzle, none of them have the full picture. And I think when I think of my experiences um, as a caregiver, um, most recently my mother-in-law unfortunately was hospitalized and I have an enormous amount of respect and even more so um, now that I'm closer with the work that I'm doing in the OHT to actually see the challenges of the practitioners to Dr. Affleck's point who care and want to provide care for their patients but are really stymied to be able to do that in any kind of efficient or effective way. We're in the emergency department. We're like full on hallway healthcare. There's, she's in the hall by a garbage can. That's how they're labeling her location. And the physicians are showing, they're texting each other pages of charts and showing it to each other in the emergency department. And I watched this happening and I thought, you know, I'm also a privacy nerd. So I, I totally appreciate all the risks that that behavior could possibly present but they're just trying to help people. They're trying to help people without a lot of tools and they're trying to do the best for their patients. Um, and this is kind of what we've left them with, the lowest common denominator of taking pictures on a cell phone and, and texting one another. And I just know it doesn't necessarily need to be this way. Um, my own personal experience, um, I have psoriatic arthritis, juvenile onset, so I, I've been involved with the healthcare system for many years. And about three years ago, I subscribed to Dot Health, which is an institution independent portal to get your own health records. And I have to tell you, I'm a pretty activated patient. I'm pretty informed. I have my binder. I thought I kind of knew what was going on, but it was a definite revelation to actually see what was in my chart. And I think the thing that I would leave this panel with is I sat in my rheumatologist's office with all the information asking about a full body x-ray that they were doing based on a longitudinal study. And the resident said, we didn't order that. Your doctor must have ordered that. And I was like, mm, no, you got, I, I don't just go for full body x-rays for fun. So I'm quite certain it would only be here that that requisition would have been made. And he looked and he said, but it's not in your chart. And I went to my dot health app and I said, yep, it is. It may not be in your physical paper chart in the office, but it's part of my EMR because I can see it. And he went, what the heck is that? And I said, oh, it's like, it's like a window into my EMR. It's like a copy of your file. And he said, well, I can't read your phone. Like this is your health information. And I like the cognitive dissonance of you literally don't have my information. I do like, and it's a copy of it. And he said, he gets the rheumatologist who her approach was also very interesting. Why do you have that and not me? And I don't think that came from a, a bad place. It was her own frustration at trying to manage the practice and seeing the access to the information that quite frankly, she wanted in a way that was a little better laid out. But as a patient, I sat in the waiting room for 45 minutes. They sent someone to the file room in the basement they got the paper chart because apparently this is the only source of truth and then said, you're right, we did rec x-rays and yeah, we don't have the results back. We don't know where they are. So I, you know, to me, I think there's massive cultural things that need to change in order that we have the operability that Dr. Affleck alludes to. 
I think there's massive ways for the system to get more efficient and as a patient to actually understand the order of operations or what's happening in any kind of meaningful way. I think there's tons of opportunity, but there's a bunch of things that have nothing to do with tech that we need to solve for first in order that we can apply the right solution and have everyone kind of row in the same direction. Anna, thank you so much uh, for sharing a beautiful combination of your own professional insights and experience uh, around some of these questions related to privacy, related to risk, but also your personal experience. And one of the things that I very much appreciated from the session that was held for, for hearing your voices this morning was acknowledging that there's a personal cost to sharing your story. And it's really easy for us to listen to your comments and, and allow it to be grist for the mill in the discussion and to forget that it's your life and that it's had impact on you when you were sitting in that uh, appointment, when you were sitting in the waiting room, when you do have to share your story. And so whether it's you, Anna, or Carol Ann, or others who share those very personal aspects of their lives, I think it's important for us to recognize that that's a commitment that you've made that it doesn't come without personal cost. And uh, that uh, I know there's a lot of consideration that people have to make about, am I going to put the time and energy into sharing my story in the hopes that it will be productively used, that it will actually move this dialogue forward. And so I would like to honor your sharing of your story today and have that commitment to really move this dialogue forward as we explore this question. Today. So thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. Let's go to Maureen next. And I've had the great privilege of working with Maureen uh, through the Ontario Caregiver Organization. But she's coming us, to us today in many different capacities. Maureen is a caregiver, she's a nurse, she's an educator and a researcher. So I know she has a diversity of perspective and experience to bring to this dialogue. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you next, Maureen. Um, thank you, Amy. Um, it's a privilege to be here and, um, you know, to be involved in sharing my story, both as, as a nurse, as a nurse educator for many years, and as a caregiver myself. And, and I appreciate everybody's perspective. And I think that I just want to start off with um, just for saying that it seems like we're all on the same page. Um, there's lots of commonality and themes that are coming through both from, you know, the healthcare providers perspective and the personal stories of caregivers across the board. So um, I think we're, you know, at, at a great point to be having these conversations and hopefully it will create change moving forward. A little bit about myself, um, you know, I've been an RN for 30 years and uh, 25 years ago in ICU, I worked with sort of the first computers uh, at the bedside in ICU and it, it was amazing. We loved it. We loved the ease of its use, the fact that we can get diagnostics results back quickly so that we can then communicate with our, uh, you know, physicians. Um, it really was, uh, just a great revelation. Um, but we had a computer at every single bedside and every single room. And so moving from there onward, um, when I got into nursing education and started doing clinical uh, nursing education, um, there was a huge lag behind that first computer at the bedside to uh, trying to move nursing students through, there was almost zero acknowledgement or zero um, practical use of technology. And so I do feel like it, it has lagged behind and uh, COVID has really um, highlighted that piece. And I think that technology can be used very successfully, but we really need to stay, take a step back and make sure that we are using it from a relational knowing perspective. Because from a personal lens of being a caregiver, I have seen how wonderful it is. Um, you know, not having to take my mom to a doctor's appointment to check out a, a surgical incision that was done um, and being able to just snap that picture 
up to the surgeon to get that feedback and then it goes right to the pharmacy and I get it sent to her door um, provides a lot of um, you know ease and and decreases my stress as a caregiver of trying to work full time and look after family and where do you find the time to go to the doctors with your mother when you're dealing with this so so that was absolutely wonderful but then I've also seen the other end as a caregiver who, um, you know, a couple of months ago had to take my father-in-law into the emergency room. And frankly, in that four hour time span, we saw multiple people who frankly only looked at the computer. All they did was looked at that screen and plunked it in. And then they moved us to another room, asked the same questions, looked in that screen. So nobody ever even looked at us in the face. So I think what's really important, and certainly as an advocate um, of relational knowing from what I have been doing for the last 20 years with my nursing students is to remind them and embed in them, we cannot forget about the caring piece, about the human behind whatever it is we're doing. And that's the problem with all of these tools. Yes, they're all fancy and they're exciting, um, you know, to try and use, but how much does that then take us away from the human connections? And um, one of my biggest concerns is the fact that I, I feel personally, hospitals are driven by metrics. And those metrics then dictate sort of what else that needs to be done because we need to be efficient and we need to be using our time very efficiently. But nowhere in any of those metrics are we actually measuring the relationship we have with our patients, our clients, with caregivers and families. And back to the basics, um, that a lot of you have sort of mentioned, we need to go back there. If, if that's what our intentions are, then that needs to be incorporated in the implementation of technology, which is not necessarily happening at this point. So I do believe we have a great opportunity to use technology to make um, our healthcare more efficient. Um, however, we cannot take away that human aspect and we cannot forget about that. Um, and so there's my spiel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maureen. And you, you've brought home what's really at the center of all of this, which is the human beings who are involved in all of these fundamental roles as patients, as healthcare providers, as caregivers. All of us are interfacing with each other and with technology and with the systems that govern them uh, in many different ways. And so how do we recognize and restore that humanity? And it seems that it's also quite fundamental to compassion in care, because if, if we forget our own humanity, then it surely will distance our, us from our own inner compassion and, and the ways that we demonstrate that in, in our relationships with others. So your point is very well taken and I think it's tied in with what we've heard from others as well, so thank you. We have one more panelist to hear from and it amazes me that we've only had introductory comments and yet there's been so much uh, to this discussion already so I'm really looking forward to seeing where we go from here. But for now, our next uh, introductory comment come from Fraser Ratchford. Fraser is the Senior Director of Canada Health InfoWay, and I'm quite sure this is a question that you've explored a great deal, so looking forward to your thoughts on this today. Well, it is a very interesting question. Is technology truly a solution? So I'm going to sort of cover three major points and come out with my answer at the end. Um, and so like Anna, being the, probably the technologist uh, point of view on the, uh, the panel, I, I, I sort of have to veer one way, but I, I want to present a balanced view on that. Um, and so also I want to, Amy, you sort of mentioned it, but I also want to mention that, you know, I've been so inspired by the caregivers that have shared their stories this morning's patients and caregivers that shared their stories which really put a point on why we have to make sure that we um, explore the efficiencies of technologies, but really examine it in terms of compassionate care and how we continue to provide care that is compassionate and meeting the needs of patients. So that aside, let's start with my three points. So the one major point is technology is here to stay. 
So technology continues to improve. Over the past few years, we've seen several advancements. So if we take Maureen's example of having, you know, computer at the bedside 25 years ago, we've now advanced a lot towards, uh, since then, around robotics, aug augmented or artificial intelligence. There's many advancements. The other thing is in the last few years, it's the proliferation and availability of things like tablets, smartphones, they've really opened up the possibilities that exist uh, for healthcare. So when we think of Carol Ann saying that, you know, taking a picture and having a, you know, using that to communicate with your clinician, that's a very good advancement that we probably couldn't have done without the smartphone. And so we have to realize that the advancements in technology are leading down that path. So in a sense, this um, advancement has led to things like remote patient monitoring. Now, when we think of sort of simple kind of things like texting, you know, video chats, we all know about Zoom now, and that's because of COVID. But, you know, now we see some of these simple things that can actually help advance the way that we use technology in healthcare. And besides that, there's lots of apps and other solutions to help one manage their health and their well-being. A point on the technology is here to stay is the cost of technology is continuing to decrease. The availability of it is much more prolific. Now there is an equity issue. It was touched upon this morning in, in, with uh, people talking about that. Um, and so I think that is something important to acknowledge as well. My second point around, is it the solution? Well, Canadians want to use technology. They use technology in their everyday lives. Carol Ann said, you know, she can order meals, she can do all these things using technology. Why can't we do that in healthcare? And in fact, we, uh, we did a recent poll at InfoWay and we found that Canadians believe it's important to have technology that makes healthcare as convenient as other areas of their lives. Canadians also believe that having access to their health information and other tools empowers them. And that's important as a patient, a family member, or a caregiver. Those that use technology say that it saves them time. And that we have to consider whether they're urban, like Carol Ann trying to find a parking spot, versus rural dwellers that have to travel long distances to seek care. The other thing is Canadians are beginning to realize that a virtual visit, or let me rephrase that as a non-in-person visit, is not substandard care, but it's as good as, and maybe even sometimes better than an in-person visit. But what we have to realize is there's a time and a place for both types of scenarios. And not every visit can be a virtual visit, but there's many in-person visits that could actually be a virtual visit. Um, the vast majority of Canadians who've had a virtual visit have had positive experience. So we've got lots of data on that and like 96% um, feel comfortable with the privacy and security. A lot of them say there's good quality. There, certainly there's room for improvement, but most people are finding it a good experience. And so to sort of wrap this up and bring it to my third point is technology is only a part of the solution. It can reduce barriers um, um, to care. And I think things that uh, you know, we have recently seen, such as reimbursement, reimbursement is one thing that has made it more available uh, for people to use because the clinicians aren't reimbursed for their time, then they're not going to be supportive of using um, virtual solutions. I think digital health equity is an important thing, whether it be geography. So, the uh, technology solutions can bridge that divide into uh, for those that live far away, um, as well as those that live near. Not everyone we realize have broadband or data plans, but there are options and we must keep these individuals on our radar. They can't be excluded from he healthcare. Um, we, others have already talked upon workflow and interoperability. So I, I think those are important considerations. But one of the biggest um, is around change management. Clinicians and citizens alike need to be prepared, equipped, and supported to use technology. I think the thing around um, change management is if we bring this back to compassion 
in healthcare, it's all about empathy, and that's a big component of the care process. But how do clinicians do that? How do patients feel that when it's in a technology environment? And I think we have a lot to share with, with, with each other to make sure that that compassion exists. Thank you so much, Fraser. And it just astounds me that we've heard from five really interesting people and different perspectives and that even going fifth, you've had so much to bring to this discussion that extends it even further in terms of where we go from here. And that's always a question I have in my mind when we have these really general generative discussions is, you know, so now what, right? Because if I was asked to summarize where did we land as a panel, I would I think it falls into the yes and category. Yes, technology is a part of the solution, and there's a litany of considerations and factors that need to be looked at, and you've rounded out our consideration by really bringing equity to the fore, and that's been a significant part of the discussion throughout COVID for many of us because there's a deep concern that people who are marginalized will be further marginalized through what's unfolding related to COVID, and there are significant risks uh, in terms of technology, and if we don't consider all of the factors around hardware, around software, around connectivity, and how people use these things in their daily lives, uh, it's, it's, it's so important to look at it from all of those different uh, facets. So we've had the chance to hear uh, from some of the people listening into our discussion, and we're going to go shortly to some of their questions. But I want to call out some of the key themes that we've heard so far, because you may want to tie those in uh, with some of your, your thoughts. Many of you have touched either directly or indirectly on the importance of co-design and really having all of the stakeholders who are a part of this process at the table as we look to that now what question when we're designing solutions, let's not assume. Uh, and certainly uh, in uh, my role at OCO, every time I think I, I know what the answer is gonna be, you'll bring a, people to, a group of people together in a room and they'll tell you you're wrong, which is awesome because that's the best part of having those kinds of discussions because they can talk about, well, this is actually what I need. So I think that that value of co-design has been highlighted in the discussion so far. The other thing that's been touched on uh, either implicitly or explicitly is around culture and that we are human beings who individually and collectively implement the use of different systems, different technologies, whether that's in a healthcare setting or even uh, uh, in our homes as caregivers, etc. But the culture around how we interact with each other, share information, trust each other, care for each other, that that's, that's really fundamental here. And to that end, I feel we could have a whole other discussion just about education and how we all, what we all need to learn going forward. Uh, and then there's that relational component, which all of you have touched on, uh, how we relate to each other and how we um, interact at that very personal level. And that was one of the other themes that emerged from the session this morning. People talk about their lived human experience. That's what we remember. We don't remember the technology. We remember how it impacted us and we remember how it made us feel. And so the same is true when we interact with other human beings throughout a healthcare journey. And then we also have um, this question of equity and how do we ensure that whatever solutions are designed work for everybody, are accessible for everybody. So uh, some fantastic themes have emerged and I encourage you to uh, consider those as we move forward in the discussion. But we've got some great questions that have come already and I wanna thank everybody who's put them forward. Uh, we'll try and bundle some of them together so we can cover as many as possible and I am keeping an eye uh, with the help of our amazing team on those questions and so if you have other thoughts that you'd like to explore with the panel, we'll have uh, some time, we'll do our best at any rate to cover as many of those discussion points as we can. But we have a group of questions here about portals and looking at portals as a part of the technology solution. So I'm going to explore, uh, there's a few parts to this question. I'm going to share it all out and then I'll, I'll ask for some input uh, from uh, members of our panel. 
So how will technology help healthcare professionals improve the ability to communicate with each other and with patients and caregivers, not just during COVID for virtual experience, but also communication and having patients understand what is being said of their diagnosis or treatment. Given that most patients spend very little time in hospitals and portals are offered almost exclusively by hospitals, how can we get a more complete picture of our personal health? And so uh, exploring this question uh, a little bit further, it says it seems each hospital or hospital group is doing their own thing when it comes to developing a patient portal and virtual care solution. So wanting to explore that question as well. So I wonder, uh, Fraser, if you have some thoughts on this, uh, given your background and your comments today, uh, interested to hear your perspective. Sure. So I think portals are, again, um, you know, a tip of the iceberg in terms of the um, solutions that need to exist for patients to have uh, access to their own information. So, um, you know, are they offered exclusively by hospitals? Uh, I think it depends on where in the country you live. For example, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Quebec, there are provincial portals that contain your health information that people are, are able to view that information. Um, you know, it goes back to, um, you know, you can see a test result in there. Um, even today, you're seeing your COVID results in some of those solutions as well. So um, there may be examples where, um, you know, some of the information is specifically um, by hospitals, um, you know, over time that may change or um, there's certainly regional views on some of these things, but I think it's important to realize that there are examples where it's a much broader view than just a local hospital view on your information and, and um, you know, systems are recognizing that it's not just acute care information that makes up your personal health information, but it's also your primary care information and other um, where other places where you receive care. Um, the other thing it also said, how does it improve communication with um, between clinicians, but also between clinicians and the patients, families and caregivers. And in many of these portal solutions, there are um, messaging components to it so that you can message back and forth um, to your uh, clinician as a patient. And also some of these solutions also have, um, and Ewan could probably talk to this better than I, I could, but there are also solutions that enable the clinician communication so that it becomes part of a whole care plan that those that are on a, on a team can actually communicate to one, other, one another about the patient that they're trying to give care to. Thanks so much uh, for your thoughts on that. Anna, given your uh, experience that you shared with us earlier and also your professional experience, I wonder if you have some thoughts on this question as well. Sure. So, I mean, I think it's great that we've finally gotten to a point where most institutions have some version of a portal that some subset of their patients can access because at least headed directionally in the right direction. I think the challenge with the concept of portal, while I understand why that is the chosen execution method, electronic medical record systems are super big, super complicated. They don't play nicely with other technology. So the kind of first thing that you can practically do is create a window into that system through a portal. So I think it's the place we have to start, but I think the thing that we should all think about is if that's the place that we start from, it al always is going to be acute focused, um, episodic. It's not going to be easy for other practitioners to read. It, you're always going to have the complaint that the way in which notes are even being captured may not be comprehensible to lay people. All of those things are true. I would kind of push back on all of that to say, if the objective is the care of the individual and medicine is a team sport, we need to make it accessible and easy, not just accessible. So like my family doctor doesn't have 35 minutes to go into a portal and, you know, hunt and peck around for information. We need to design it so that it is interoperable, that it's not a tsunami of information, that it, there's like a right sized amount of information presented and you can dig deeper. And it's designed around the needs of patients, caregivers, and practitioners, not institutions. But I'm hopeful that at least we've we've gotten far enough to have the portal. So like access to the information is less contentious. Now we need to kind of optimize so it's actually useful. 
you and I get the sense that you might have some additional comments on this question. Would you like to chime in on this? Oh, yes. Sorry, I just unmuted. I, I could go on and on here. Um, thank you very much. Um, you know, portals are a fascinating, uh, you know, as Anna sort of said, they're, they're a moment in time. They sort of represent a lot in terms of our journey in, in reimagining our relationship with health information. Um, so what, what I mean by that is, you know, who, whose information is this anyway? Whose information are we talking about? Well, according to the Supreme Court of Canada, patients own their health information, 1992 McInerney versus McDonald. Do we operate that way? No, like everyone, all the people I see are going like this. We do not. So, hey, Canadians, you own your health information. The Auditor General of Alberta did a little lovely little study, I think it was in 2017, that looked at, at comparing banking information to health information. And so you go to a bank. If, so he said, basically, if, if banks operated the same way your uh, your health system does. You'd go to the bank and say, uh, you know, my home branch is back in Yellowknife. I'm in Edmonton right now. Could I take out $100? And they said, certainly you can have $100. We'll just, just sign this form and we'll fax it back to your home branch. And in two weeks, if you're lucky, you can come in here and get your $100 if they happen to send it. <laughs> they said, well, what do you mean? This is my money. You're, you, you can't just give it to me? So, well, no, we're, we, we're, we have to be careful. We're protecting your privacy. That's often the answer, you know. So, I mean, and, 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 and so we, we really have to, portals are, are, are an adaptation that allows a service-centric health information system to begin to acquiesce to patients to give them a tiny modicum of control over something they actually own, right? Uh, so really the question we should be asking, you know, in Ontario, there are like a hundred different portals. Fraser, maybe you know the actual number now, but it's, it's nearing a hundred and they're all based on given. So if you're someone with complex health issues, you could have about 15 different portals from your radiologist, from your GP, from your hospital, from whomever. The, 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 yeah, so Carol's putting up her hand. This is crazy. And this is what is burning people out is the information is all over the place. And I would suggest that by fracturing the information in such a profound way, it becomes quite dangerous. You know, Anna made statements that I could not agree. You know, we're, those of us working in the system, I have taken images of people having um, um, acute bleeds in their brain and sent them to the neurosurgeon in Edmonton begging him, say, just look at this. And I've showed them to the Minister of Health here to say, and say, well, you can't do that, Ewan, because this isn't secure. And I said, well, the guy's gonna die and I have no means to get that information across jurisdictional boundaries because there's policies that say I'm not allowed to do it or the informational environment is not, does not have integrity. So this is what we're dealing with. So again, sorry, I go on and on and I will stop here, but the whole issue around portals is that they are an adaptation that, that through which we're trying to make something work that is really just very poorly designed because health information needs to be designed around the patient, not around services. It shouldn't be each service having a portal. In fact, the patient should control all their information and we as providers need to adapt to the patient. And then said, why do you have that? Because it's mine, because <laughs> I am the owner. And I'm sure the rheumatologist or whoever you saw was, was just trying to cope, but we also have to reimagine our role. We are no longer the stewards. The patient should be this, well, we're stewards to degree. The patient is the owner and we have to honor that in our architecture of health information. So I'll stop there. You know, the, those buckets, if I can call them that, of sort of the human beings, the technology and the system. In a way, our discussion and the way these things go ends up looking a bit like a Venn diagram, right? You've got mm. your humans, your tech and your systems, and then somewhere in there, if you're lucky, 
you might get <laughs> into that sweet spot in the middle of the Venn diagram. But many of you have talked about patient-centric uh, care, planning, etc. And so in a way, that Venn diagram needs to be destroyed and replaced with a different model that really allows the patient to be at the center and for the systems, the technology, and the human beings who care for them to be fully wrapped around that individual and, and all of their needs, which includes their right to privacy, but it also includes their right to timely, effective, and compassionate care. Uh, Carol Ann, I think when I saw your hand, you might have also wanted to chime in on this discussion, or were you just um, uh, wanting to echo that comment? I'll certainly give you the floor if you have more to add here. Thanks. I did want to pick up on what Anna was saying about patients not being able to understand the notes that the doctors write. And that's quite true because um, when my husband got his diagnosis for his cancer, we actually sent it to our son, who's a PhD in biology, and his wife, who's a vet, for them to translate for us what it was they were saying. Um, and I think one partial idea solution to this would be if doctors would write their notes to the patient instead of about the patient. I think we would all understand, and I'm pretty sure other doctors would appreciate that level of um, note so that it's easier for them to understand. Obviously, you need to get into some detail and technical terms, but I think if you write to the patient so that they understand, then everyone else will understand. And getting back to Ewan's point, education can't be underestimated as a big factor in this. Um, our uh, our uh, orthopedic surgeon, when I asked him if Bill was strong and if Bill's heart was strong enough to take another operation, he said, well, I guess you can talk to the cardiologist if you want and find out. They're both in the same hospital. Like, why am I at the center of this? It just adds to my burden. And I wouldn't understand what she said anyway. Um, so it's not just a matter of educating about the technology that we need to use and we all need to sit down and talk about what each of our needs are, but also about the way that we need to work now. We need to treat the whole patient and we need to interact. It's, it's all of us working together to bring this patient back to the best health outcome that they can. Thanks for that, Maureen, or sorry, thanks for that, Carol Ann. You know, it's, it's really bringing home that point that many of you have raised around that art and science component, right? There is a science to this. I mean, you're technologists and informaticians and healthcare providers, and you have skill sets that can be replicated by other people, but there's also that art form that is, is, so much more intangible, but part of this process too, and that's where that human and compassionate component comes into this. Maureen, I know you've got a comment to this, and I'm going to also add some of the, another theme that's related in the hopes that we might be able to bridge the discussion, because it should come as no surprise that one of the other themes that's emerging in uh, the questions is around virtual care. Um, so I'm going to raise a couple of questions, and then if you wish, you can tie in with one or more of them. And Maureen, if your comments tie in with just this part of the discussion, that's fine too. But we have some questions around, given the low uptake uh, uh, around virtual care uh, pre-pandemic, how do we sustain virtual care post-pandemic? But there's, there's a, a couple of related questions here that I think we can join in the mix. So uh, there's a question about how healthcare providers are protecting our personal information from cyber attacks and ransomware, which seems to be uh, a part of this discussion as well. And then another question related to integrating our care goals and our plans around technology to, to uh, help support some of these outcomes in, in which you know, virtual care may be a part of the solution. So, uh, a little bit of a potpourri style, if you will. I'll turn it to Maureen next, and then if you'd like to jump in on any one or more of those types of questions, we'll take it from there. Maureen. Hey, um, I just want to 
wanted to, to, to add because we keep talking about this relational knowing and, and so there's this theme about, you know, putting the patient at the center and putting the providers sort of on the outside with the, the, the patient in the center. And I, I just have to emphasize, and I'm sure you can speak to this as well, if we think back to when we were in our educational programs, um, it's in our curriculum, it's in the, the medical curriculum, it's in PT curriculum, it's, it's a nursing curriculum, patients are at the center and it's been there for a long time. The challenge is when we get into a system that isn't person-centered and metrics are attached to efficiency and not about relationship, then healthcare providers get um, burnt out because they're trying, but the system itself won't allow it. So, so I just wanted to advocate out there because, um, you know, I see it, right? I mean, we, I, I'm training nurses, we're in clinical and at the center, it's about the patient. I don't ask them about the, what is the diagnosis of? I ask them, okay, how does that affect the patient? How does that affect the caregivers? You know, pull those into your thinking and how are you going to help that bigger picture? And so they graduate with this perspective, but then they get into a, an environment that doesn't allow them to use that clinical decision making that the educators of these professional programs have been emphasizing um, for four years, six years, eight years, um, can they actually follow through on that? So I just wanted to sort of make that clear um, that, that some of those are the things that need to um, be fixed in the process. So it's not about the technology, it's some of these processes are broken. So whether we add technology or not, um, those are some of the things that need to be fixed before we can even move on. So um, I think with respect to, I just want to add one thing around the, how do we sustain virtual health post COVID from a caregiver's lens, um, I am all for it. I don't think I'll ever go back to the family doctor or the specialist. If they're going to allow me to do this virtually, then I am all over that because it fits in my schedule. And we got the same results as what we would have gotten if I had physically gone, you know, putting, you know, Carol, my mom's a much more littler person than your, your husband, but still, oh my goodness, you know, I worry every time I'm trying to get her in that car and then that's the walker and it's the parking and getting close enough and, you know, dropping her off at the door so I can go and park and think, oh my God, she's going to fall before she gets in that building. So um, I think for those who are comfortable and have experienced that sort of positive virtual healthcare, they're gonna continue. With respect to where we bring it, um, again, it needs to be individualized, right? There's still a lot of people out there who want to go and see their physician, who want to go and see their healthcare practitioner. And so we have to allow it. So I think when we talk about sustainability, it needs to be a different lens than this pandemic crisis that we're in. And so I will leave it at that. Thanks, Maureen. I saw some fairly vigorous nods from your colleagues on a lot of the points that you were making, particularly around education, culture, but also choice and having choice about, okay, I'd like to come in or I'd like to do this virtual. And there may be instances where one or the other is a more appropriate solution, uh, but the opportunities to have choice, I think uh, I, I see some uh, fairly strong agreement amongst the panel. So I'm wondering if anyone has follow-up thoughts on sustaining virtual care, also this question around risk and exposure uh, related to data. Uh, through um, virtual solutions and, and and where we go from there. Anna, thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, as, as um, Maureen was talking, I was thinking about transitions in care and like post-operative transitions and just the, our reliance on little mimeographed sheets of paper with phone numbers and and everyone wanting the best for the patient. But it being really disconnected. And a lot of what I see as processes in healthcare are actually people with, who don't work after three o'clock and don't work on the weekend. And so as a patient or a caregiver, it's not uncommon to find yourself in a position where you actually don't know what to do 
no one's made it clear or told you, and there's no one to call. And so I think that there's a massive opportunity to do some of that education post-operative discharge for patients that want it um, digitally. And my hope is, like my big hairy idea hope, is that there might be a way to kind of connect the system in a way that says, almost like the game of life, like we thought this was going to happen, but oops, you took a left hand turn. Here's the way to get back onto the road. Like here's the last person that you spoke to, or here's a number that you can access at 1130 at night. And I'll just give you a really simple anecdote. My husband spent two weeks at London Health Sciences at University Hospital, probably at a cost of a million dollars to our healthcare system. They performed absolute magic. He was discharged with no information and the first VON nurse told us that he needed a very specific bandage for a very complicated necrotizing infection that wasn't covered under OHIP and no one knew where we could buy the bandages. And I was like, that seems like a pretty important thing for us to figure out soon. <laughs> and I don't know how to figure this out. And the solution to the problem, and this is where I have so much respect for people that are on the front lines, I think this lovely nurse stole it from the hospital because she would just show up with it every week saying I keep asking where to get it I don't know I still don't have an answer but we got you we're, we're, we got you covered for another week and I think how can one institution invest like to such a large degree to save his hand to, to do perform magic and the whole thing could have unraveled he could have been readmitted with an infection over a $20 a day band-aid that somehow does no one pays for and no one knows except for the hospital where to buy them so I, I know that there's that example is like times a million for all the people that have some weird break in their care. And there's ways like we, someone in the system knows exactly how to navigate all those things, but you need to find the person. And I, I don't think we should have to know who to call. It should kind of be laid out and be able to be navigated in a way that gives that continuity for patients and caregivers. Yeah, Fraser, you've got follow-up comments on that. And before you uh, chime in, system navigation comes up in our conversations an awful lot as one of the most critical needs uh, that caregivers and the people that they care for have, right? I, how do I connect all these dots? Or, or to use your analogy, how do I move through this in my own actual real life game of life? Uh, so, so thanks for raising that critical point. Uh, your thoughts, Fraser? Well, I think if we think of that question of sustainability, um, I think that that's a crucial question to uh, to explore. Um, at the height of the pandemic, when we were sort of doing, um, you know, reaching out to Canadians and asking them their thoughts, and like 60% of people were now getting virtual visits. Um, and so, you know, I think part of it is now that they've experienced, those that have experienced it are more likely to want to continue it. So, you know, we, we kind of need to ride the wave um, because I think there's some importance of that. Um, same with clinicians, the clinicians who've never used it before that were now forced to, it's the only way they'd be able to provide services for their patients are realizing, oh, we can actually do this. I have to change some things in the way that I might do it, but I can. I think part of the biggest thing is in sustainability is we need to think about care in general, whether it's delivered virtually or whether it's in, delivered face-to-face, uh, -face, it needs to be up to the clinician and patient together deciding which modality is the right modality for them, but also so that both sides of the equation are compensated, like, you know, so that there is funding to actually perform what makes sense. One of the other things around sustainability is that, um, you know, going tech and reducing travel is a very green um, endeavor. And so one of the uh, things that we found, if 50% of primary care visits were to shift to virtual, uh, we would save um, close to 325,000 metric tons of CO2. And that's about like taking 70,000 passenger vehicles off the road for a year. That's a, a really compelling statistic. And it, it, it's interesting how it brings together that sort of macro perspective and then the micro perspective of both Maureen and Carol Ann who have talked about the anxiety associated with getting to an appointment in terms of risk and in terms of logistics. And uh, so those are really interesting uh, considerations for all of us, I think. 
We have a question uh, that I suspect all of you will have perspective on. So I'm just going to read the question and then we can work together to figure out uh, how we'll explore this. Leadership across the country is critical. Who is driving collaboration at regional, provincial, and national levels? And are they interacting with each other to develop a national strategy that meets the needs of patients and caregivers? So I wonder who has thoughts and would like to kick us off with exploring that question. Ewan. Let me go off mute. I think that's a brilliant question. And I think that that uh, really goes to the heart of what ails us. And that is that fundamentally no one has been in charge uh, in, in the end of, of designing these systems. Um, and you know, so we've ended up with a with a deeply fractured system around services, you know, patient centricity, uh, you know, which Maureen said was is taught in as sort of a foundational sort of concept in terms of care, does not exist in in uh, in terms of our informational environment. So there's a cognitive dissonance that has occurred. And so I hate to use the term, but so patient centricity in terms of health information in Canada is fake news. Uh, so, uh, and I do, I use that just because of the day it is today, <laughs> just sort of as a humorous reference. It isn't fake news. It just doesn't exist. It doesn't exist really informationally. So the question is who's in charge then? Uh, and if you evaluate this, no one's really in charge of, of, or historically, no one has been in charge of designing health information systems. I mean, I, Fraser and Infoway certainly have had a national role in trying to, to, to set standards and trying to join us, but, but based on the structure of Canadian healthcare system and from the Constitution to the Canada Health Act and so forth, um, it can, healthcare is, is, a, is a jurisdictional um, mandated activity to oversee. So, so an entity like InfoWay can sort of try to compel people or they have, may have money that it can be fairly compelling, but there is actually no overarching vision that anyone is obliged to anywhere. And then within provinces and territories, this is further broken down. And so that's why a lot of what we're saying, so if, if we set out initially to create one standardized approach to operability, um, there was no one in charge of this ship, so it didn't happen. Um, so with COVID, there has been substantive changes uh, and, and Health Canada is now quite involved uh, in, in, and again, without necessarily the authority conferred upon them by the Canada Health Act, but they are involved in trying to join jurisdictions and, and other, other entities. They, uh, so I know more about physician uh, related matters, but the AFMC, which is the association of all the medical faculties in Canada are looking at, at, at a, a uniform approach to virtual care training in, in medical schools and the 17 medical schools in Canada. And, this has not occurred. There is no virtual care training largely other than one-off efforts. Uh, so there's a lack of, profound lack of literacy among physicians being prepared for this environment. Um, the regulators, so the professional regulators, physician regulators, now are looking at transportable licensure so that physicians can be in different jurisdictions and still provide care. Let's say their patient has crossed a border and gone somewhere, they can do virtual care there. So there, there are a host of things beginning to occur that, that I think show substantive pro, uh, promise. Um, and, and this really goes to the root of the issue that if you do not have a shared vision or someone in charge of something and you have your hockey team and every player is on a different rink without a coach, then you're going to not have a very good hockey team. Uh, so anything else on the solution side of that? So we don't all leave, you know, adequately devastated by your comments? Yeah. Um, so, sorry. And I, well, the solution You actually did we, give us a, a slight cause for optimism. Yeah, so, yeah. But I just, so, you know. So, so fundamentally, I, I actually, I believe in, in, in 
the the inherent value in of this technology and i continue to believe that this will improve and and so there needs to be a reimagined governance of 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 health information um, health information architecture and technology which follows in canada and patients first and foremost need the the owner of the information need to be central to basically all levels of input and in but so do professionals, so do administrations, so do technologists and so forth. So this needs to be a, a multi-sectoral and, and we need a shared vision. Without a shared vision, right? And you see that I see this fracturing again, even after COVID, it's beginning to regress to the old state and we're bound by our constitutional reality here. But without a shared vision, we will continue to struggle. And there are places like Estonia, like Kaiser Permanente in the United States, different, the country of Estonia, different things, different places, different entities, different health organizations who have actually achieved this in a meaningful way. So I think there is a path, but we have to identify the problem. And there's a deep and profound problem of governance over health information architecture in Canada. And, you know, we can't work together to co-create a solution if we don't really identify the full extent of the problem. And, uh, you know, I certainly don't uh, want to pretend that this discussion is the be all and end all, but I think it's covered a lot of the complexity uh, around this issue. And certainly, you know, with a will to bring people to the table and a, a desired end goal of co-creating a solution that that must be something that is feasible and i'll just add one last thing and the problem with reinventing this is is it displaces people who have authorities in a given place right now mm -hmm. and that becomes a huge threat so this is so we have to we have to get over our personal threat about in our backyard and recognize that the greater good because this is a shared problem this is a shared problem of technologists, of patients, of providers. We're all working in this environment that isn't quite working. It is a shared problem and we will all benefit if we can agree to put our current structure aside and reimagine this. Thanks so much for your comments on that. I want to cover uh, one final grouping of questions and that is related to long-term care. And I certainly uh, believe that everybody here is either personally uh, familiar with or at least aware of all of the issues that have been reflected in the media and have been uh, an area of focus for a number of us in our professional practices over the last several months related to COVID. So we have some questions on long-term care Care. I'm going to pose them together and then um, we'll look to the members of our panel to see if you would like to chime in on one or more of the aspects of these questions. So first question is, retirement residences and long-term care need to be able to help their clients who are of a certain age who may not be as technology savvy. Is there going to be a requirement for improvement in health technology services through the private long-term care and retirement residences going forward? Uh, I'm going to um, add a, one more long-term care question and then also a question related to seniors. So uh, specific to long-term care, lots of great ideas, but we seem to be spinning our wheels when it comes to long-term care and other issues. How can we pilot an initiative and then actually put it into practice and ultimately put it into widespread use? And then I'll add this third question related to seniors. Is there work here in Canada or elsewhere globally to look at the needs of seniors as they age? What are their needs and their caregivers' needs and what technology so solutions are out there to meet those needs? So uh, looking for thoughts uh, from folks in this group, Maureen, I'll go to you first. So um, I can speak a little bit uh, in relationship to some experience with respect to long-term care. Um, so I'll do that first. And um, 
I think that some of the solution really involves our future training of those healthcare professionals that are in the long-term care. And I envision it as uh, incorporating it even into nursing education, uh, PSW education, um, in which it becomes part of their um, knowledge and their, their interventions that when they're in these organizations, they can then start to utilize some of this technology to help support um, the older adult, um, because it's been my experience in teaching my mom at 79 to, to use an iPad. Uh, she loves it. Like she, she just is, is, you know, and we got it for her because of COVID. And I was like, oh, we need you to have something that's a little more user friendly and that kind of stuff. And I'm telling you, we, we can't get her away from it, from socialization, stimulation, FaceTiming family in, in, in BC and talking to her brother. Like, um, it has been like truly a revolution for her. So I think that if we look at it in that lens, instead of us sort of assuming that um, they're, you know, the older adults aren't capable or that type of thing, that um, we need to get past that because maybe they're not capable because nobody sat down and talked to them about it or provided it to them. Um, and then um, from a, a researcher's lens, um, you know, this, this work that, that introducing um, smart technology with my mom and keeping her safe as a care um, recipient has what's driven my research. And, and I can tell you, there's a lot of caregivers out there that are, are seeking their own avenues to ways to find, um, you know, solutions to their very busy schedule. So, and, and, and based upon, you know, qualitative study, it really it involves, they're looking for solutions around, you know, keeping their loved ones safe, um, stimulation, socialization, keeping them to stay independent. And so um, they're finding those solutions, whether it's we're using text, we're going to slowly introduce uh, Google Home now because, and even to, oh, you know, what? my grandmother loves this, this uh, radio station and this music and she knows how to tell Google to turn it on every day. So, so I think that we need to just change our perspective and look at how you know, a lot of these great smart technologies we've marketed really to a very different generation without looking at, well, how can it benefit this older generation? Um, so it's absolutely doable and, and, and hopefully through, um, you know, some next steps in my research, I'm going to continue to do that. Um, and when we talk about some of the disconnect in the systems, um, I just wanted to add, there is absolutely, there's a, a federal funded organization called AgeWell that their entire focus is looking at innovative um, technology to support older adults aging in place and aging healthy. Um, but part of it is getting that across and marketing that this even exists. Um, I only found out a bit because I'm this researcher and I had to go and do my traditional lit search and I went, wow, look at that. There's this uh, organization that exists. And so, so communication and, 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 and having better ways of, of, of sort of sharing this, I think, um, needs to be done. So I shall end with that. Thanks, Maureen. I appreciate your comments on that. And I think uh, giving all of us encouragement to overcome the fears or the perceptions that we might have uh, around technology and the use of technology with people in different uh, demographics, right? I wonder if anyone wants to chime in around the long-term care questions as well. And there was an additional question uh, that ties into long-term care, so I'll add that uh, to the mix. How do we recover the human relationship which has been lost? Look at long-term care. How might we leverage benefits of efficiency through technology so that there is time for the human aspect? So whether it is that question or one of the earlier questions, does anyone have any thoughts as it pertains to long-term care? It certainly has been a significant uh, point of dialogue in the last uh, several months. Fraser. Well, I think, um, you know, long-term care, um, like every other aspects of care, also has to come along. And, um, 
you know, I think COVID has pointed out some of the inefficiencies in that system and technology is what, but one component of that. I know InfoWay, we, uh, we sponsored a project in Ontario around long-term care, making sure they had access to some of the results that are being, you know, available on some of their residents. But that's just a small portion. And, and I think, again, long-term care as a sector has to look at their information management approach and making sure that information is available, is be able to be shared with patients, families, and caregivers. So I, I think it's kind of one of those areas that is more nascent and um, they might be able to leapfrog ahead, but it, it, it's certainly an area that needs some concentration, but it is just like our whole sort of discussion today, the technology piece is but one component, um, but it is a component that I think has um, uh, not received the fullest of attention uh, in those facilities. And I'll give you the last word on, on this question. So we've been living this reality. My mother-in-law uh, is in long-term care and was admitted during COVID, which was an experience to say the least. Um, but the iPad has been her lifeline. Um, we, we visit her outside, but it's hard for her. So the fact it's such a simple thing, but it is extremely impactful to have weekly calls with her. We can see her face. I, you know, respect how much people in her home are running off their feet to try to do more with less, but just that five minutes of bringing the iPad, setting it up for her and like connecting us makes all the difference for her. And so for that, I'm really grateful. I, I think I echo Fraser's points. We also get random calls, no name, no callback number to talk about a medication change that's not articulated, which is a horrible feeling as a caregiver, especially when we can't physically really see her at all. Um, but the iPad, sometimes simple is best. It's such a simple thing. It's a five minute thing. It is very meaningful both to her and as well to us. Thanks for your comments on that, uh, Anna. I, I think, uh, you know, sometimes we think we have to have like a, a really fancy or grand solution, but sometimes it's actually the simple and elegant solution that works the most effectively. And uh, so it's, uh, it's nice to hear that example. We are getting close to the end of our time here and we've covered so much territory that I want to be sure we have a chance to hear some final reflections from everyone in our group. Uh, you and you've raised this idea of reimagination a few times and so I think that that could be an interesting reflection for the question that I'm always asking myself in these kinds of discussions about where do we go from here. So if you could reimagine where we go from here. If you had the opportunity to send us in a, in a different or slightly modified direction, what would that be? And if that feels like too big of a question, I'll give you an out, which is, can you give us one call to action? So you have to, option one is a reimagination and option two is a call to action. Where do we go from here? That's really where uh, I'd love to close things out for us today. And Ewan, because I see you're unmuted, I'll invite you to uh, kick us off for this. Okay. Uh, thank you. No, I'll do the reimagine thing. I like that. And, and, and despite all my, my uh, critical appraisal of the last 31 years, I, I actually, as I said, do have faith in the, in the place of technology to actually uh, promote quality care and, and, and relationships and compassion. So I think it, and, and the iPad, you know, with my, my 87 year old mother-in-law and Zoom calls with the whole family are, are very special. And so we can see how this can happen. It is tangible. It is, it is occurring in many of our lives, but only on an episodic disorganized way, right? So I, you know, reimagining. I, I, I really think that that um, it really comes down to to defining really what. It, it, there's been a paradigm shift. We've entered into a new era in in our use of information in the world, and and all industries have had to reimagine themselves, and we've just been a laggard in that. So I, I, I really think that there is an opportunity to profit in the, in the era of, of global warming and climate change 
to, to join ourselves. This, these technologies, like everything we actually need to do in healthcare is basically on this phone. It all exists. The technology is not the issue. It is not the issue. So I have here, you know, I can do video conferencing, phone, I can send text, I can take images, I can network anywhere in the world with this thing. And yet in healthcare, I can't even send someone's chart to the clinic across the street. <laughs> you know, I mean, so there's a, a disconnect here. So this all exists, the technology exists. What we have to reimagine is this thing that I referred to at the beginning, which is human interoperability. In order for us to adapt to the promise of the technology, we need to reimagine how we have to change our industry from an analog paradigm to a digital paradigm, which is very different. And this means edu ed education is different. So we, we are literate now. Uh, regulation is different. Policies are different, right? Our culture changes our roles and it's not a physician centric system anymore. It is a patient centric system. That is what needs to happen. We have to reimagine the human architecture or the human interoperability. Thank you so much for your final comments on that. Uh, Anna, wondering what your final thoughts are in about a minute. Sure. I love what uh, Dr. Affleck said, and I, you know, think if we all, all of us, patients included, put down our collective egos and try to work towards a system, because it sounds all the time that we all agree with what the outcome is, but we, we just get tripped up on how to get there. Um, I think we've all kind of reflected that the tech exists. I think the thing that's that's keeping us is the way, the inability to reimagine what different would look like, and that's certainly what. I do in innovation. And so that idea of a beginner's mindset and a blank page and a co-design and, and not bringing or trying not to bring current ways of doing things or biases into it, it's a hard place to start from, but I think it's the right place to start from. And I, m more than ever, I'm heartened that more and more people are recognizing that you got to kind of do the work. You can't just skip a bunch of steps and get to a solution. You kind of have to start at the beginning. I wish it weren't so, but it's, I've never seen change not started at the beginning and kind of work through the process. Yeah, really important reminder there about going back to the beginning. So thank you for that, Anne. I appreciate your comments. Maureen, let's go to you next. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to opt out and go with call to action. Um, and and from, from my experience, um, I have seen change happen over the 30 years of, of, of being a registered nurse with respect to education. And, and I'm a strong believer that if we start with our sort of newer generation and we integrate this perspective in there, and, 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 and look at collaboration. I mean, we have now moved from, you know, being siloed in our educational programs to ensuring that we have interprofessional education where we're working so hard to have nurses, doctors, physio, um, OT, radiologists, you, you know, all in the same room envisioning the same thing so that we can better understand ourselves. So change does take time. But that same change I can see with now bringing in virtual health, right? What are some of the best practices? What are out there? Let's start having that dialogue. And maybe that dialogue will begins in our IP um, courses, um, which um, even through this event has now made me think and re-envision like, how can I start you know, building that conversation? Um, and also opening up the door to go past healthcare providers and bringing in those IT experts. Um, mm. Because we all live in a world um, that owns language and that language allows you to be involved in that world. And so for us to go outside of that world and into the IT world or uh, you know, that type of stuff. I mean, it's scary. And, and all of a sudden I thought I was an expert and now I was like, I don't know what that means. What does that initial mean? That you're right. We have to take our egos away and, and pull back and say, it's okay. Yes, I'm an expert here. 
and you're an expert there. And let's first start with the talk conversation of well, what does that mean in your world? Because I don't understand that initial, right? Um, and so it's doable, right? So it can happen. So that would be my call to action is, is that I, I'm going to bring this forward, at least in my realm of nursing education and where I can to, to move these things um, forward. Thanks so much, Maureen. We are down to our final moments. I'm going to go to Fraser next for your final and hopefully very brief thoughts. They will be very brief. So a reimagined healthcare system is one that doesn't automate the current system. So let's, let's make sure we actually restart. And my call to action is let's make sure we continue collaboration and make sure that collaboration involves the patient, family, and caregiver. Great, thank you very much. And Carol Ann, you get the last word. Thank you, Amy. Well, you know that I'm involved in a lot of different organizations um, to try and move this forward, but it's disjointed and it's taking too long. So I really think we need um, a table where there are provincial leaders and patients and caregivers who are advocates in each province with a federal look at across Canada um, and how we can move this forward. And in, the first thing we need to do is have tech people make sure that we have equity across Canada in terms of access because that we're only going to be able to move forward if we can all move forward together. Thank you so much, Carol Ann, and to each of you, Maureen, Anna, Ewan, Fraser, Carol Ann, I deeply appreciate your time, your insights, your personal stories, and the opportunity to explore this together. Uh, we didn't have the chance to reinvent Rome in the time uh, uh, that, uh, that we were here, but I think we moved the dialogue forward. And uh, so I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation with all of you, but also with everyone who had the chance to participate in various digital platforms thus today. So thank you to each of you who's watching this live, who engaged in the discussion, and who maybe the recording as well. We appreciate it. And let's please continue this really, really important conversation. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you.